All right, can everyone hear me? Perfect. So, well, I see a few people uh, wandering down and uh, finding some seats. I want to welcome everyone to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. Uh, we're back once again on site on a slightly uh, dreary day, very overcast. Uh, while people are here getting uh, seated and settled, uh, I want to invite everyone to do go on to our website, uacnj.org. It's where you're gonna find a whole list of all our member clubs, our upcoming presentations and events, and all sorts of information about what type of telescopes we have and our mission. Uh, in addition, you can check us out on our social media pages. So we have Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. We have our Discord uh, up and running. So do join us there. Ask any questions you may want. Uh, as my reminder, we do live stream this on both YouTube and Twitch. So if you ever uh, can't make it down or anything, uh, you can always uh, join us online. And if there's anything you're like, man, that was super interesting, but I forget the name of something, you can always go back and see our past broadcasts as well. And uh, on, on our YouTube, where you uh, can ask questions or go find the fact you found really interesting. Now, for the people here, I have a little bit of an additional safety briefing. So because we should be good, I've been looking, we've been looking at the radar and everything, but on the off chance that it does become hazardous to stay outside, I will let you guys know at which point we will all stand up and you can either proceed indoors where we might try and wait that out or uh, if it's going to be longer, we'll switch to indoors at which point uh, do listen for myself and my other co-volunteers directions as to what to do and we'll get you everyone safely. It's just we do not want people in a, the outside surrounded by metal tubes. Oddly enough, if it becomes stormy, that's not a safe thing to do. All right. So in addition, when we go to leave here, it's going to be dark. We are going to use our headlights. We do not like getting run over. If you need to use the bathroom here, uh, we do have the porta potty in back to my left, your right. I also have a little uh, museum area and gift shop where you can go check stuff out and ask questions. But for now, our presentation is my astronomical journey. I had to remember because Cliff, you do a lot of them. I, and I forgot which one we were on. So Cliff uh, became an astronomer in August of 1942 when his mom finally let him stay up past 11 to watch a total lunar eclipse. He grew up in Ohio and was a science nerd at an early age, building simple refractors from surplus lenses. And by the time he was 12, he finally bought an amazing build your own 5,000 times a telescope advertised by the, in the comic books for only $3.85. If only today we had things like that. <laughs> uh, later on, um, he built many more telescopes and then went on to go uh, get a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Cincinnati. Got married and started a family and then moved to Berkeley, California, where he did research for his doctorate in organic chemistry. Got a PhD. Sorry. Just like you, I have trouble when the text gets too small. <laughs> but regardless, he has many, uh, has done many a talk up here at UACNJ. Uh, since we've brought him on, he's a great friend to many of our observers and volunteers here. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Cliff. Yep, perfect. Okay, I guess you can hear me now. Uh, I have a minor crisis. The uh, uh, slides are not advancing, so let me figure out what's going on here. It doesn't work.
that is very peculiar. Jeff, you're being summoned. I need some IT help. Sorry, guys. Because sometimes it helps to have more than one person to rubber duck off of. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. You know, technology, you love it when it works, and uh, so the other times. Because I can't read the, th I can't read the slides. And kiosk mode did that, but then the, okay, now we'll, But I can't advance the slides now. Something disabled by arrows. The times I wish I paid attention to when we put it into kiosk mode, I would be able to tell you where that is. <laughs> well, if I have to, I'll turn around and read the small print. That I can do. Presenter mode, and then hold on. Yep, I'm bringing that. It'd be difficult to do it until you click it. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll live with this. No, we don't want to do that now. Yeah, I know, but I. I well, let's see if it, w it will advance to the first slide. It did. Okay. There we go. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. It actually did most of my talk for me. But, uh, this talk is somewhat autobiographical. In fact, it's completely autobiographical. Uh, those of you who are astronomers will uh, identify with a lot of the experiences I'm going to tell you. And those of you who are not astronomers uh, will probably gain insight into the peculiar behavior of friends or spouses who are and their obsession with telescopes and looking up in the dark at ungodly times of night. Um, early experiences. I uh, watched the eclipse of the moon from Cincinnati, Ohio, actually it was Madeira, a suburb, on August 25th, 1942. I was 3.81 years old, and I remember it like it was yesterday. My mother let me stay up uh, late to way past uh, bedtime uh, to watch it, and I was very happy about that. My little brother, who had been bored a few months before, he was just a baby. He couldn't see it. But it was very impressive, and I was hooked on astronomy. Now, Mom's science fiction magazine covers provided a lot of early lessons for me. Planets, rocket ships, alien life orbs, otherwise known as bug-eyed monsters. Mommy, could I go to that planet? How does that rocket work? How far away is Pluto? Pluto was still a planet then, you know. Uh, early learning with my parents' help, 
I was making solar system diagram with the right labels by the time I was five years old, and they included Pluto. I, I was uh, I got science oriented Christmas presents, uh, things like uh, um, things like microscope sets, chemistry sets that actually made explosions, and uh, books, both scientific and literary. My mom thought that I should get the uh, Iliad when I was six or seven years old. It wasn't in Greek though, but I enjoyed it. I still think Achilles is a rat, but but um, I was trying to make telescopes with eyeglass lenses and and surplus magnifying glasses. But I saw this ad in Popular Mechanics magazine. Uh, no, not the one about the guy with the accordion. This one. Oh, when I read that. I, you get a complete lens kit with all necessary fittings, and it gives you 80, 50 power, 100 power, even 250 power, and only $3.49. Well, I collected pop bottles. You would probably call them soda bottles, and traded them in for money and saved up my pennies until I got enough to order this kit for the ma from the mail. Well, when it arrived, I got this. A very thin magnifying glass that had a focal length of 80 inches that was supposed to be my objective lens. Uh, some little fisheye lenses. Uh, th this was kind of a low power magnifier. And these were r very strange little lenses, but they were supposed to give me the very high magnification. And all necessary lens fittings turned out to be a sheet of cardboard with some little discs printed on it that I was supposed to cut out with a razor blade. And the instructions, uh, well, I'm supposed to mount the lenses in between those little discs and ask my mommy for a spool from thread and cut that in half and I would mount that behind it and that would be my eyepieces. Also, Ask your father for a downspout. That was going to be my tube. Well, I did this as the best I could. And when I got, got it together, the result was not pretty. Um, I have a cardboard tube from a toilet paper roll and lots of tape to hold those eyepieces I made. And out at the end was that, that objective lens. And I, there's the downspout uh, gutter pipe that... Uh, my dad got for me, and my mounting was a pile of cinder blocks. Well, the result, with the lowest power eyepiece, at least I could recognize what I was looking at, a tree on the other side of the, of the yard. But you notice there's kind of color fringes around the edges, and it's kind of blurry. And if I use the next higher power, just 100 power, it got bigger, but it didn't get better. The color got worse, and it was just plain blurry. And any of the higher power lenses were just hopeless. There was nothing recognizable at all. Well, I told my dad that it didn't turn out as amazing as the ad said it would. And, and uh, he said, what did you expect for $3.49? And then he said, more kindly, I thought, I think you need a better lens. I'll go see Nathan." Well, now, Nathan was a friend of my father's who had a pawn shop camera store down on Vine Street in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he said uh, he, he had known Nathan for years as a result of his part-time job as a studio photographer. And he was sure that Nathan would come up with something that I could experiment with. Well, you remember these things? I'm sure you've got a picture of your grandmother or great-grandfather uh, hanging on the wall that was taken with one of these cameras. These are a studio view camera. And the guy put that thing over his head and he looked behind it and he focused the lens with that knob in the front and took pictures. Well, Dad brought home one of the lenses from one of those things. It was, the camera was missing, but he still had the lens. And I took it apart. I was very good at taking things apart. And we found inside there was an acromatic lens on one end, another identical acromatic lens on the other, and a simple lens in the middle. 
Well, I knew I needed an achromatic lens, so I took it apart. I took it apart, and I got those three-inch diameter achromatic lenses out. Wrong way. And he also brought me a brass spyglass. And I figured I could unscrew the objective off of that. And there's a nice eyepiece in the back. Uh, can you see my cursor? I guess the cursor. Oh, there it is. There's a there, there's a eyepiece in there that makes things right side up. Well, I put it all together. Wow, and it worked. There's the one of the lenses from the uh, from the old view camera out in the front, and the um, spyglass with the objective lens removed, so I could use the eyepiece on that. And an old tripod from a panoramic camera. He got that from Nathan also. And I put them all together. And my goodness, here is the view from my backyard over the valley to it just a power line in the distance to my telescope to look like that. Wow. Got me a real telescope now. The um, the moon. I'm out of the rain. Are you guys getting wet? The Pleiades looked like this. Believe it or not, that's Jupiter, and I could actually see cloud bands on it and the Galilean satellites. And that's Saturn, but you could see it had rings. You couldn't see much detail in the rings, though. Uh, this was, now that I had me a serious telescope, at least for a... 12-year-old boy, it was a serious telescope. Well, I learned a lot with this telescope, but by the time I was in high school, I was beginning to learn the limitations of my instrument. I had to keep it stopped down to about an inch and a half because it had spherical aberration, and that made uh, the images blurry if I tried to use the whole, the whole lens. I tried to see the canals of Mars at the 1954 opposition, but nothing. I didn't get any better views with my dad's surveyor telescope, but it was, uh, didn't see any canals. Now, I had been reading the amateur telescope making books by Albert Engels, and I was now considerably more sophisticated about optics. I realized that I needed to make my own telescope, uh, reflecting telescope, by grinding, polishing, and figuring a telescope mirror. It didn't look too hard in the books. Well, Edmund Scientific had a kit for, that had all you needed, and it was only $11.95. Wow, still cheap. This would be about $120 in today's money. Well, here is the ad that uh, uh, Edmund Scientific had in Sky and Telescope magazine. Had it had all the stuff. It had the glass, the abrasives, the rouge for polishing, pitch, and it even gave you a couple of lenses to make an eyepiece with and a diagonal mirror, all for eleven dollars and ninety-five cents. I decided I would go for the six-inch kit, and I persuaded my parents to let me order it for a Christmas present in 1954. My dad was a little skeptical, but uh, he was convinced by my argument that it was not a sucker deal like the last time I had ordered something from uh, uh, online. Well, I learned from the ATM books that I needed to get a barrel and make a way for holding the uh, glass plate glass tool on the top of the barrel and you put some abrasive powder and a little soapy water on the tool, and you plop the Pyrex disc, disc on top of it and move it back and forth on top of the abrasive. And then keep doing this using a kind of a W-shaped stroke. And every now and then, you walk around the barrel, and you just keep doing that and keep doing this. You do this until the abrasive wears out. You put some more on and keep doing it until finally uh, the top disc becomes concave and the bottom one becomes convex. And there's a, it took about three weeks of all my spare time to get it deep enough. It was only about a 46 thousandths of an inch deep. 
but I had this formula from the ATM books, and that told me that at that depth, I had a radius of curvature of 98 inches, which would make me a mirror with a focal length of, uh, of, of half of that, 49 inches that would be. So at that point, I had to clean everything up so thoroughly that there's not a grain of the abrasive left, and switch to the next finer abrasive and continue and continue. Two months later, I had gone through all of the abrasives that I was finally on three micron emery uh, powder, and my Pyrex disc had just the right curvature to make a mirror with a 48 inch focus and had a beautiful satiny fine ground glass finish. I carefully melted the tempered burgundy putt pitch that was supplied with the kit and I poured it onto my the cleaned up convex plate glass tool and plopped the Pyrex disc, disc into warm soapy water then concave side down I smooshed it onto the warm pitch and moved it around until it was all in contact. I then carefully slipped the disc off and trimmed around the edges with a single edge razor blade and then scratched a checkerboard pattern into the surface. This gave me my pitch lap that I'm going to polish it with now using Jeweler's Rouge. I then made a suspension of the Jeweler's Rouge from the kit in soapy water and in a squirt bottle, wet down the lap and resumed the barrel dance around and around and back and forth. Polishing went well. Surprisingly quickly, only in a couple of days, the surface became shiny with, uh, with nothing visible on the surface except for a few scattered pits of coarse abrasive that I hadn't quite ground away. But that's okay. Uh, it, it won't uh, spoil the image any. And if I tried to polish, polish those out, it would take an eternity using rouge. Well, now, uh, we have a way of testing these things called the Foucault test, and I learned how to do this from the ATM books. You you arrange a, uh, a, a, a light bulb inside of a tin can with a hole in the side of the can, aluminum foil over the hole, and a needle hole through the aluminum foil, and you you reflect that light off of the mirror it's not a really a luminized mirror, but glass is reflective enough. And you put your eyeball <coughs> behind the image of the pinhole. And if you move a razor blade in and out of that cone of light, you will see this. On the top is what you see if the razor blade is inside the focus of the pinhole. And the bottom is what you see if it's on the outside. And if you have it right exactly on it, you get this funny looking thing that gives you a very good idea of what the surface of the telescope mirror is, is like. Uh, it's easy to set up, even by a kid, and you can see defects in the surface only a few millionths of an inch high. I'd spent the next six months wrestling with that lumpy looking sphere that I had. Uh, the perfect parabol paraboloidal surface that was supposed to give me the sharpest focus was supposed to look like a donut, not the kind that uh, um, was being passed out, but not the hole of the donut, the whole donut. That's what it was supposed to look like. A shadow on the edge and shadow in the middle on the right side. Well, I got all sorts of strange figures but I finally managed to get a cor the correct uh, change in radius of curvature for all of the zones according to the formulae in Tetsuro's book on telescope making. Well, I wrapped it up in cotton batting, packed it in a plywood box, and entrusted it to the U.S. mail. I sent it to Leroy Clausen uh, for metallizing with Baral, which is an alloy of aluminum and beryllium. It, he, oh, he did it for only $3.50. There's his ad in Sky and Telescope. Turns out Leroy's son Dudley is still in the business and will still uh, coat telescope mirrors for you. Well, I, it survived the trip. 
and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever made. This was 1955, and I was uh, uh, a junior in high school at the time. Well, not about it. Well, I got out the old tripod that um, that, it, that Nathan had uh, got given my father, and I borrowed a couple of pipe fittings, you know, with a 45-degree L and a T and a couple of... Uh, of uh, pipe nipples. Okay. Can we still see it? Okay. I even filled up a coffee can with cement to make a counterweight. The bearings would be the threads on those pipe fittings and the uh, Right there would be the polar axis bearing, and right up uh, ah. <laughs> well, underneath that piece of wood would be the declination axis bearing. I put a cardboard tube from the trash, and I mounted my mirror in the bottom with some push-pull screws to uh, let me adjust it. And uh, the, the diagonal mirror they gave me, I mounted up in the top with a spider to hold it. And the eyepiece that they, that they gave me, I mounted that in some plastic tubing. It really worked well. William Herschel should have been so lucky. He didn't have an equatorial mounting. Well, anyway, the telescope worked great. It was all I could hope for. I finished the mounting in the summer after I graduated from high school. And I used it with improvements to the mounting until I built my 10-inch reflector in 1970. I still have the 6-inch mirror that I made when I was a kid. What I could now see was something spectacular. I could see craters on the moon with a great deal more detail than I could with my, uh, my little uh, scrounge from the view camera telescope. Uh, Mari Crisium was very impressive. I can really see the, the rings of Saturn now, not just imagine that I could glimpse them. And I could even see the moons, the five moons of, of uh, Saturn. Well, activities with this six-inch Newtonian telescope over the years included lunar and planetary observations. I learned crater and feature names on the moon. I learned the cloud belt structure of Jupiter. Uh, and I could sometimes see the Cassini division on Saturn. Do I see canals on Mars? No, dang it. Still don't see canals. Can I find Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto? Yes, yes, and no. My telescope was not quite powerful enough, and I wasn't skilled enough to find Pluto. Double stars? I can resolve some of them. I could measure them, but no, no, I could not measure them. I didn't have the equipment. I could see uh, Messier objects. By the way, Messier catalog is a list of dim and fuzzy nuisances that was compiled by Charles Messier. He was looking for comets, and he would find these fuzzy things. He thought there was a comet. He would watch them for a while. They didn't move. He said, dang, I'll put it in my catalog. Well, it turns out to be a great list of deep sky objects that we amateurs use all the time. Galaxies, nebulae, star clusters. Uh, I even did lunar occultations of stars by the moon uh, in coordination with some guys from the U.S. Naval Observatory. I, I carried my telescope down a railroad tracks many a night to get to the right place to observe these things. And I understand that the result of that program, they found that the moon was 60, 60 miles smaller in diameter than they thought it was. Imagine Neil Armstrong trying to, trying to land 60 miles high. It wouldn't have been pretty. Uh, higher education. Well, I, I finished my bachelor's in chemistry at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I was there for 1956 to 60, and I traveled with my wife, Kitty, and my infant number one son to California and enrolled in the doctorate program in organic chemistry at Berkeley. 
while taking chemistry courses, teaching undergraduates, and doing research, I still managed to do some astronomy. Uh, the machine shop available for the graduate student use was a great place to improve my old pipe thread mounting for my five inch tele or six inch telescope. And there I learned how to use a machine lathe and milling machines, skills that came in handy during the construction of the Amateur Astronomers Incorporated 10 inch refractor. In my last year, I had enough free time to enroll in Astronomy 101 taught by Dr. Paul Hodge. He later became the department chair at the University of Washington. During that course, I got to use the 8 inch refractor on campus in Leuchner Observatory, which gave me much better views of Mars than I got with my 6 inch telescope, but still no canals. And as part of a class project, I was even able to use the 12 inch refractor of Lick Observatory. I was supposed to be looking for the wave of darkening that was supposed to come down from the poles when the water melted and the vegetation began to grow. We had some odd views about Mars at the time. Well, this was the telescope I got to use at Lick Observatory. It was in the smaller dome to the north end with the big 36 inch refractor on the south dome. But this was available for student use, and, and uh, they, they gave me a very quickie course, and I used it until well after midnight observing Mars that night. Here's a sketch that I made from memory. Uh, I, I turned in a class paper on my observation, and it had several drawings. Uh, I didn't get the paper back, though. Uh, Dr. P uh, Paul Hodge kept them. But you can see in this uh, uh, um, drawing, the uh, north polar cap and Mare Acidalium, and I believe this is Mare Erythrium up here. However, I did not manage to see the wave of darkening. I didn't see any vegetation growing, and I didn't see any of Mars's famous canals. Seeing was just too bad, I thought. It was very windy, uh, but I was able to complete my class project. Uh, the assistant prof who gave me the ride from Berkeley up to Mount Hamilton was not as lucky as me. He was planning to study, to use the 120 inch reflector to study the spectra of Wolf Rayet stars. But the wind was so high, they would not let him open the dome all weekend. But after I closed the dome of the 12 inch and walked out into the dark ha hallway between the two domes, I heard music coming from the other end of the hallway. I walked over and carefully peeked in the door, and I saw Dr. Hendrik Vandenbos measuring double stars with a filer micrometer on a 36-inch refractor while listening to Bach organ music on his portable phonograph. Uh, he's long gone now. He died in 1974, but he still holds the record for the most visual measures of double stars. And he was just cleaning up on some observations he had made back in the 40s with this particular telescope when he was seeing if the stars had moved. That's a fine telescope. It's pretty much only used for public outreach now, though. I, after I finished my doctorate in organic chemistry in the fall of 1963 and left California for a research position with Union Carbide in New Jersey, a job I held until I retired in 2003. During this time, three more sons arrived on the scene, and they became involved with my hobby of astronomy also. Union Car at Union Carbide, I met my good friend Frank Kovitz, who is also a chemist and an amateur astronomer. Uh, he taught me computer programming, and we had many projects together, including building an all-electronic hardware automatic guiding machine which we did astrophotography with a 5-inch lensless Schmidt camera that I built. There is a series of articles in Sky and Telescope about this in, 19, in the Gleanings for Amateur Telescope Makers in 1974. Frank and I also created the program Sky Travel, which is the first planetarium program that would run on a personal computer, the Commodore 64, with a graphical user interface. 
1984, we got a Best Educational Program of the Year award for that program. And it ran as an exhibit for a while at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. I think they were selling the program uh, in the museum shop. Oh, and by the way, in the audience here is my friend Mark and Keith Sproul. Uh, uh, Keith really did a good thing for me back then. I was able to get from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory a big uh, tape reel, half-inch wide tape that I had no way of reading. That had all of the data of this of the uh, the new general catalog of galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters, the dark nebulae, the uh, Yale double star catalog, and he was working at Rutgers at the time, or he was a student at Rutgers at the time, and was able to use their their uh, tape reading equipment to transfer all that data to eight and a half inch floppy disks. So. We use that to get, get into the program. And by the way, you can't run this on a Commodore 64 anymore unless you kept one in the attic somewhere. But uh, uh, Keith's brother, uh, Mark, has got it running in, uh, um, uh, what's that program system you run in? Linux. Linux. Right, you've got it running at Linux with the whole Gaia database in it. So it's really grown up. Imagine fitting the Gaia database in a Commodore 64. Well, that I met Amateur Astronomers Incorporated in 1964. I learned about them from Roger Cuthill, uh, joined the club, and made some friends with some really serious telescope nuts. And I learned a lot more about building telescopes and astronomy. I took part in the design of Sperry Observatory, and as chairman of the AAI Design Committee, I designed and helped to build the 10 inch refractor at Sperry Observatory. It's operating today and is in good shape. And if you visit Sperry in Cranford on a Friday night, you can look through the telescope. It's a fine visual instrument. Uh, while I was designing the objective for the, re the 10 inch refractor, I explored variations on the Schuppmann telescope design and discovered a version having all spherical surfaces. This became the basis for the 13-inch Schuppmann and McGregor Observatory at Stellafane. My home observatory has evolved over the past 25 years. Here's my first uh, uh, observatory. It's a little uh, six foot by eight foot shack. Uh, it looks like, well, I do have a little crescent boot on the door. I guess this is to make people think it was something else. But the, uh, the roof opens up like this. And uh, I, I originally had a 10-inch Mead schmidt cassegrain inside. I later installed my C11 Edge uh, Celestron uh, in, in there, and I did my um, uh, speckle interferometry research with that. Uh, a few years later, 2001, I built observatory number two. It was also an, uh, op a, a roof with folded open to see the sky. There's my uh, observatory guard dog, Noah, uh, at the, uh, on the job. Uh, I now have my C-14 uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope installed in that observatory. Uh, here's what it lo looked like after that was finished in 2006. And I now have my 7 and a quarter inch Schuppmann installed in there. This is my favorite lunar and planetary instrument, and I'll show you some pictures taken with it later. Uh, this is Chewy. He's current head of security at Perineville Observatory. He's the third dog to hold the position. Current research programs, I, I still I do lunar and planetary uh, observations, but I use the technique of lucky imaging. Uh, I did, I've done double star measurement both by aperture photometry of images taken with uh, both the charge uh, coupled device uh, cameras and CBOS cameras, and speckle interferometry, where you can beat seeing with tons of math. Resolve things right at the theoretical limit of the optics. I'm currently exploring the local supergalactic cluster using both long exposure imaging and live stacking. I'm sure that if you come up here on a clear night, you'll see some folks using 
live stacking for electronically assisted astronomy. You can, you can get images of these dim, fuzzy objects that look like pictures in the textbook in just a few minutes. I still do star occultations, both lunar and asteroid and Kuiper belt objects. And nova and supernova observations, I did spectroscopy of RS Ophiuchi when it uh, erupted a couple of years ago. And I'm currently using aperture photometry to measure the brightness of the supernova and the uh, galaxy Messier 101, the pinwheel galaxy. So here's some pictures I took. This is a uh, mosaic of images uh, taken with the uh, uh, A174, ASI-174 on the 11-inch um, uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, here's another mosaic. Uh, the moon image is big enough on these telescopes that you can't get it all in one picture. So I take six to nine or so images and stitch them all together in Photoshop afterwards. Here's some zoomed in uh, views of Sinus Iridium, the Copernicus Crater. Uh, this one really freaked me out. I thought I was seeing the this giant space worm from uh, uh, Star Wars that thing coming out of the uh, uh, the crater uh, Fred home there. Very strange looking object. But I looked at it a few nights later and it changed. It didn't look like a space worm anymore. It was just a little hill in front of the crater. But it was fun to watch it. Here's a nice view of the northern part of Mari Imbrium. And look at those shadows of the mountains on the rim wall uh, extending over into the dark floor of Plato. Some more craters, and uh, the the wrinkle ridges in Mari Serenitatis is because the moon is shrinking. It's slowly cooling down, and the rigid crust is buckling because the whole thing is getting smaller. And you can see some boundaries between uh, lava that had di different chemical composition. I took this image of the sun in hydrogen alpha line with a, a Coronado in a solar telescope, uh, which unfortunately has died on me. The ethylon has become dislodged. It doesn't, doesn't filter anymore. Here's a picture of, of Mercury that I took in the daytime, and there is a visible crater there. It's the crater Rembrandt. It's 440 miles in diameter, about the size of uh, in, uh, lots of Pennsylvania and most of New England and New Jersey to boot. but. Uh, it's, it's hard to see uh, Mercury because it's very close to the sun and you have to observe it in the daytime. Uh, here's some images of Venus I got. The one on the right I got just July 10th, not very long ago. Uh, we had uh, unusually good seeing that night, so it's quite sharp. You can't see anything on the surface of Venus because the clouds get in the way. Observations. Uh, op oppositions with Mars. I really want to see canals on Mars. Uh, because Mars has a more elliptical orbit than the Earth, the, uh, the oppositions vary considerably in distance. They range from 35 to 65 million miles, uh, depending upon what time of the year the opposition occurs. The first op opposition I remember observing was in 1954, the one I did with my little homemade telescope lens and my dad's surveyor's uh, transit, uh, no canals. The opposition of 20, uh, 2003, which is um, uh, this one down here, uh, was the best in recent memory, and it was my very first opportunity to make images of Mars by the lucky imaging method. I've imaged every opposition since then. Uh, after a series of favorable winter oppositions, they became gradually close, closer until uh, the one in 2018 was 36 million miles away, nearly as close as in 2003. There's the one that I uh, was observe, uh, trying to see canals with my father's transit. Uh, back in 1954, and um, here's the one that, uh, let's see, is it, is it in here? There we go. 
This is the one that I observed from Lick Observatory, but still saw no canals. Uh, these are pictures I took from the 2003 opposition. I used a little webcam. You remove the lens and put an inch and a quarter adapter on it, and you can stick it in the eyepiece hole of your telescope. And that little cheap webcam intended for, you know, video chat uh, did a beautiful job on, on, uh, on Mars. The, a lot of, of the surface features are visible, uh, including uh, uh, Mare Samirium over here, uh, Sirtis Major right there, uh, Sinus Meridiani, uh, some of uh, Mare Eritrium, and Solus Lacus. Uh, but still, no canals. However, on the opposition of 2014, not a particularly favorable one, but the seeing was good on this particular night, June 3, 2004, and I saw a great amount of dark features on the planet. Here's an annotated version where I have them labeled. Uh, look at this dark feature. Uh, here we go. The one I call Deuteronilus. Deuteronilus means the second Nile. You can imagine that somebody believing in canals named that one. Well, it turns out that if you look on the globes in the museum at, Lick, at the Lowell Observatory, Percival Lowell uh, annotated these with the canals he saw. And uh, uh, one of Percival Lowell's canals, Mark Deuteronilus, is on that globe. And that's what I saw in my image. Now, the trouble is, it's not a canal. There's no water in it. What it actually is, based on uh, spacecraft imaging of Mars up close, is that this is at the boundary between this high cratered plateau up here uh, called Arabia. Lots of craters up here. It's relatively high in altitude. And down this part down here, is the northern abyssal plain where Mars probably had an ocean at one time. And this little boundary is sort of like a continental shelf going down to the ocean. Well, it's all exposed now, and there's dark colored rock, and it's on a slope, and the winds blow past that from the Arctic area, and it keeps the sand off of it, so it's a dark streak. But it's not a canal. There's no water in it, and there's no Martians on their little boats. But I finally got to see a canal. Uh, here's some pictures I took of Jupiter in 2003, and it shows the transit of Ganymede and its shadow on the, on the surface of Mars. And in the background, you can see the satellite Europa going behind the disk of, 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 uh, of Jupiter. And if you enlarge the image a great deal, you can see, uh, actually see uh, some de surface detail on the satellite. This light colored region here turns out to be uh, a bright uh, feature on Ganymede called Osiris. And it's on the side permanently facing away from Jupiter. Um, here is an animation that I made from all of the images I took that night. You can see Europa going behind the disk now. And here comes Ganymede. And right after Ganymede came off, its shadow left. But this was obtained with my 10-inch uh, Newtonian telescope, the first telescope I made after the 6-inch uh, I made in, in high school. Here's another image of, of Jupiter I took with the uh, the C11, uh, the Celestron C11 edge, uh, a lot of detail in the cloud structure, and you can see the giant red spot just going off the disk to the upper left. Uh, here's another animation showing the great red spot moving into view. Uh, the Earth would fit inside of that red spot, but by the way, it's shrinking. It's getting smaller over the years, and no one quite knows why. It's probably losing energy to the surrounding uh, cloud structure, and uh, the storm is finally winding down. 
Uh, here's an image of Saturn I got in June 1, 2013. Uh, not only are we seeing the Cassini's division, but lots of cloud belt structure on the surface of the body of, uh, of the planet. Here's my images of Saturn I've taken over the years, starting in March of 2003, uh, when I first was using the little Phillips 2U cam, down to uh, last year, uh, where I got this picture at the bottom. Uh, I believe I took that with the ASI 183MC with my Schuppmann refractor, which is a wonderful planetary telescope. Uh, I, I haven't ha managed to image it yet. It's very early in the morning object, and I have lousy eastern horizon, so I'll be imaging Saturn again soon. Uh, here's a montage of solar system objects that I have imaged over the years. I'm also uh, observing things like a, a near-Earth uh, asteroid. These are uh, four pictures I took uh, showing the passage of NEO 2002 RX211. Uh, the final image is a, um, uh, an overlay of all of the images, and it's this little streak right here. That's the thing zooming by the Earth. Uh, let's see, did I say how close that was? I forget how close it was. I think it was between the Earth and the Moon, but it was, uh, it missed us, thank goodness. Uh, and here is a Kuiper Belt object. This is the uh, uh, object Maki Maki, uh, and the predicted positions were uh, shown over here. This is from the JPL ephemeris, and uh, here it is, right at the predicted position. I also did some deep sky imaging. I'm not really a, a pro at this, but this is one of my pictures of the Orion Nebulae, uh, taken with the um, um, the uh, strangely enough the Orion deep field imager from the Orion Company. Here's the Flame Nebula, fairly close to the uh, uh, Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula, all in the constellation Orion. And here is the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, it's only three to 5,000 light years away. Uh, it's the what's left from a star, much like uh, the sun at the end of its life that loses its outer atmosphere and becomes a beautiful object, leaving a, leaving a white dwarf uh, in the middle of where the star used to be. Uh, here's M13, a globular star cluster in Hercules, and M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, 2.5 million, 2 million light years away. And headed this way, you will all want to duck in about 5 billion years. Uh, here's M81, uh, a galaxy 12 million light years away. It's a, a grand spiral, uh, not a barred spiral like the Milky Way is. And here's M82. Uh, the Cigar Galaxy, it's a, uh, uh, it's an irregular starburst galaxy. A lot's going on in the middle of that galaxy. Now here's an interesting picture. This is M51, the Whirlpool Nebula, that I took on June 7, 2005. That was followed by cloudy weather most of the rest of June. And I took this picture on July 10th. There's a supernova there now. Uh, an amateur astronomer in Germany, where it was clear while it was raining in New Jersey, he discovered it, and I didn't discover it. Uh, there's a picture taken uh, not too long ago, uh, June of 2022, and there's nothing there. Uh, probably, if you could magnify it enough, you would see some kind of a nebula like the Crab Nebula there, but the supernova is gone. And finally, uh, M101 and Ursa Major, there's a picture I took on May 12, 2023, and here's a picture May 26, 2023, but uh, uh, this was another supernova discovered by a Japanese amateur astronomer on uh, May the, uh, uh, what was it, did he discover it? May 19, it was discovered, so. I keep missing out on these supernovae. Finally, M109, 
a barred spiral galaxy 85 million light years away. This is what the Milky Way would look like from 85 million miles. It's a uh, barred spiral very much like this galaxy. And this is the last slide, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can. All right. So thank you, Cliff. Uh, thank you for everyone who's joined us. So before we get into uh, our question and answer session, which we will be having, a couple safety briefings for the people who uh, snuck in while the talk was happening. When we go to leave, we are using our headlights because we like not being run over, and I'm sure, sure I'm sure you'll feel the same way. If you need to use the bathroom, that is the porta potty to my left, to your the back of the tent, and uh, we also have a museum and gift shop indoors where we have uh, some cool refreshments because I know it gets hot. Um, it has been a little bit inclement, so I don't think we have any telescopes ready to view anything because it's also very cloudy. Um, but I think we have a couple of astronomers who have at least the door open who might be willing to uh, show you, you know, the setup and talk about the telescopes. With that being said, for the people here, for questions, you're going to raise your hand and kind of wave it about. And you're going to keep your hand in the air uh, just because I'm at this point of darkness, I'm kind of like a T-Rex. My vision is based on motion. And if you put your hand down, you're lost in a sea of people. Good size crowd tonight. Yeah. yeah. So Maybe. anyhow, we're going to be starting it off with our first uh, question online. And that question was, what was that $3.49 a kit in today's money? Uh, in today's money, that would be about... Uh, uh, I actually Googled this. <laughs> <laughs> I would think it would be about uh, about maybe 15 bucks. It's only worth that, too. You're actually wrong. <laughs> Back then, uh, so for that time, and I think I used the around the correct date, that $3.49 in today's money is $44.18. Oh, my goodness. I would, I would really feel gypped if I bought it today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, th that that's a fun fact that uh, I'm like, you know what? Let, let's do the conversion on that money. <laughs> Anyhow, so question out here. Perfect. What was the lens in the 10 inch at Sperry that you talked about? It's an, uh, a Clark type airspace doublet. The internal surfaces were the same curvature. It's, uh, it's a, an achromatic refractor, not an apochromat. It's got a crown, a positive lens in front, and a uh, flint negative lens behind it. And the bendings and the power of the two lenses were adjusted to correct spherical aberration, coma, and primary chromatic aberration. It's, it has a secondary spectrum. You can't avoid that with just two pieces of glass. All right, Cliff, I'm going to ask you to scoot back just a little bit because I do know you're off camera. <laughs> oh, sorry. And uh, the people online, oddly, oddly enough, like to know there's a person. Uh, right, so our next online question is, how many telescopes have you built in total? Uh, let's see. Uh, counting the ones made with eyeglass lenses? <laughs> uh, no, the, the, that, that disaster. Uh, my six inch, uh, the eight and a half inch mirror for the Lensless Schmidt camera, uh, an eight inch um, Dobsonian, my 10 inch Newtonian, a 12-inch Newtonian, uh, and I built the mounting for the Schuppmann. I didn't make the optics for that. That was made by Jim, Jim Daly. So that's that's uh, seven in total. Nice. All right, another question from out here. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Marcus. Cliff. You yeah. mentioned lucky imaging, if yeah. I remember correctly. Could you explain what that is? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful technique. It, uh, you, you don't take a, a, a still picture of the planet. You take a short video of the planet. 
with maybe you know anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 images. And you run them through a computer program that was uh, created by a fellow named Cor Berovitz. Uh, I think he was a Belgian uh, amateur astronomer. And what it does is it sorts through all those images and finds the least blurry ones, the sharpest ones, lines them up with one another, and stacks them together uh, digitally. And he has a, a sharpening procedure based upon wavelets, which is sort of the digital version of, um, of um, I lost the word. Well, it happens when you get to be 85. So let's see what Fourier transform. It, it's it's the digital version of the of the of the uh, of Fourier analysis. And between the the two, you end up with images that compensate for the seeing effects in the atmosphere. And uh, the field is advanced. There's better programs available now, and you can see the improvement in my quality of my images of Saturn from 2003 up to 2022. Uh, and those were partly my getting better at it and also the software getting better. We are really blessed in amateur astronomy. There's lots of people who uh, learn a lot of stuff that you wouldn't expect a, an amateur to have. And they share it with the other amateurs in the community. Uh, that, that You can download that aligning and stacking program for free. Uh, so it's it's a it's a great hobby. So, but that's that's lucky imaging, and the luck is in having sharp images. In that you take lots and lots and lots of images, so you get enough sharp ones to see the detail. All right. So our next online question is actually mine. Uh, why do so many people see to gravitate from chemistry fields into astronomy fields because I started to notice a pattern. I, like I think uh, Paul has yeah. uh, BS in chemistry. Yeah. Uh, Mark out there has chemistry background. And yeah. I'm like, that's a lot of chemistry, right. not a, as much physics and computer science as I would think. Well, it's, uh, I, I think it's a matter of uh, philosophy. You know, there's a lot, another thing that correlates too, music. You think uh, William Herschel was a classical era uh, composer, musician, and conductor. He was a better observer than he was a musician, though. But, but, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's true. There's a, there's a lot of chemists who are into astronomy. My friend Frank, uh, that I spent many years and many projects with, he was a physical chemist, graduated from Harvard with his PhD. Yeah, it was just a, a weird observation I had that a lot of people here were like, chemistry field. I'm like, huh. <laughs> well, I actually had a lot of trouble in this respect. I couldn't decide, as late as graduate school, whether I wanted to be a, a, a chemist with an observatory in my backyard or an astronomer with a laboratory in my basement. But as the way things turned out, having a laboratory in my basement might have been kind of suspicious, you know. And there's a lot of people who would have gone. Why not both? <laughs> uh, right, I see another. All right, Cliff, uh, you mentioned one of the features of the so-called canals was linked up to a geological feature on Mars. Yes. Uh, have there been other examples where the so-called canals have linked up to uh, recognized geological features on Mars? Um, yes, there are several of them. Uh, uh, Vallis Marineris, one of the most obvious and biggest geological features on Mars, turns out to um, uh, have two different names. One end of it was called Agathodamon Canal, and the other end was called Caprates. So it's it's on the maps that both Schiaparelli and uh, um, uh, Percival Lowell marked. So I I think that uh, that. Uh, there are a lot of real features that, through a combination of poor seeing and excessive magnification, got linked together to, to appear to be linear features that weren't really there. That was a particularly problem with, with Lowell. He used extremely high magnifications with very tiny exit pupils for his uh, 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 
his his drawings he made of Mars, and and I think some of his are the result of eye strain. But some are real. Some are real. All right, I see a very enthusiastic person back there. Um, so while I'm trying to find this person, the next online question is, what has been your favorite telescope to use? My Schuppmann Medial. Oh, I love that telescope. It's <laughs> more achromatic than an apochromat. I mean, it's as apochromatic as a reflecting telescope. It's got no obstruction. It's got no aberrations. And it's just so sweet to image both the moon and the planets. I really love that telescope. And it's very uh, underappreciated. I think there's only about seven of them in the whole world. Uh, the biggest is the 39-inch uh, uh, um, uh, solar telescope in the uh, Canary Islands. It's a, a Schuppmann telescope mounted vertically and fed by a uh, heliostat. But it's a Schuppmann. Uh, it was uh, invented by Ludwig Schuttmann in the uh, uh, later part of the 19th century. And I'm convinced that if he had invented that 50 years sooner, we would have never had the era of big refracting telescopes because it's so much better than a regular refractor that nobody would have wanted one. But at the time he invented it, astronomers were already going to large reflecting telescopes and they never looked back. But it's a it's great telescope for me. What is your favorite planet to look at through a telescope? Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That, that was sweet and simple. Yeah, I've been looking at that since I was a little kid. <laughs> All right. So I am putting out a last call for our online questions just because we have a bit of a delay before they get to hear uh, the sense technology. Uh, was there another question out here in the audience? Keep, there we go. I lost you. Oh. I don't have to uh... All your time looking up at the stars. I know this is probably obligatory for talking about planets and stuff. And uh, Have you ever seen a, a UFO or something? Something you couldn't explain? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's a, a very general thing that amateur astronomers don't tend to see UFOs. They tend to see identified objects, you know, because we know what's up there. I did build a UFO once, and I made the, <laughs> and I made the headlines of both the uh, Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco papers during the summer of 1963. And... Uh, I would probably go to jail if I did it again. The headline was some, probably something along the lines of college student terrorizes the countryside. <laughs> no, it was actually, there were, uh, there were people like uh, campus cops, a couple of airline pilots who saw this thing and they, they, they really thought it was a UFO and that it was maneuvering at, at, at speeds that could, no human could possibly stand. But it was just a six foot diameter uh, tissue paper covered balsa wood framework, framework with a highway flare hanging underneath of it, uh, suspended from a long wire from a cluster of about 50 hydrogen filled balloons. And it drifted across campus at around 1130. And it disappeared over the Berkeley Hills, where there are lovers' lanes up there, in the direction of the planet Mars, which was rising at the time. And it <laughs> But there were lots of people who thought it was real. I, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm in Blue Book, though. But there was another kid at Caltech who had a very ingenious thing. You know, the, the plastic film that they put your, your shirts and suits in at the dry cleaners? Well, used to, they didn't have those little stamp things on them that you tore off. They were just one continuous film. Well, he got a whole roll of that a tank of helium, and a bunch of rolls of Reynolds wrap. And he went out to the desert east of Pasadena, for where Cal Caltech is, and he unrolled the film with a roll of al aluminum foil on the inside of it. And he made these things that were like as long as a whole roll of aluminum foil is inside of a plastic tube. Tied off one end, filled it up with helium, tied it off, and turned it loose. 
and the prevailing winds drifted it across the desert to the east of the Los Angeles Pasadena area over Edwards Air Force Base. Dun, Do you dun, know what dun. this looks like on radar? I mean, you can't see it because it's just a little tiny strip of aluminum foil inside of an invisible piece of plastic. They scrambled a squadron of jets up to see it. And they could see it on their radar, but they couldn't see it when they got near it. Well, it was a, a very great stunt, but he made the mistake about dra bragging about it to some friends in a bar. <laughs> And there were some Air Force officers in the bar with them. They called the MPs, and they hauled the guy away. He got kicked out of school. So, so you know, but for not bragging about it, there could have been me. So. <laughs> My favorite local cryptids, bored locals. <laughs> hey, they, they said for uh, when they were shooting several movies, you know, a lot of uh, bored locals, you know, they get in the way and decide, well, you're going to make a horror movie. Let's make it scary <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> Anyhow, so our next online uh, question is, what is your favorite bit of advice to other astronomers who have significant others who might not be as into the hobby as you are? Uh, be very careful. <laughs> 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 well, try to, try to interest them in what you're doing. Uh, uh, take them with you when you go to uh, astronomy uh, club meetings, if you can get them. And uh, be understanding that uh, uh, you don't want to wake them up in the middle of the night when you're making noise when you're going out to observe. But uh, <laughs> uh, talk to them about it. My, my wife was very interested in it, and uh, uh, she never got, she never went out and observed with me, but she talked with me about the stuff. And, uh, uh, it's interesting, <laughs> and I think an intelligent person can uh, uh, learn about it even if they want to get into it in depth. All right, so any last minute questions from our audience here? And keep in mind, I am a T-Rex, so if you put your hand down, I no longer see you. You cease to exist in the dark. I don't even have the crickets this time, but I do have a very large mosquito in front of my face. <laughs> Sorry. The thing zooms at me. I'm like, oh, okay, focus. All right, so I want to thank everyone. I want to thank you, Cliff, for another great presentation. Uh, thank you for everyone who came out and uh, braved to the brief rain shower we had, and our, also our online viewers for uh, joining in. Uh, do hit those uh, like and subscribe buttons if you're online, or even if you're here, you want to go on YouTube, hit those like and subscribe buttons. And we'll see you next time.